Um, so, good morning everyone, my name is Matt Johnson, um, I'm part of the AWS UK Public Sector Solutions Architects team. Um, I'm going to take the talk a little bit more technical now, but not too much, so don't panic. Um, I've also been set a hard deadline of 22, um, so we'll keep uh, going at a reasonable pace. But there will be time for questions at the end. Um, so, Wayne alluded to the fact that we now have the UK region. Um, globally, we have 16 regions, and I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by a region, uh, because it's slightly different from um, what other people might define. Um, within those regions, we have something called availability zones. Um, there are currently 42 of those, and we have edge locations. So, edge locations are where we deliver um, some of our global services, like our DNS, uh, like our content delivery network, and like our content acceleration services. But really the important thing I want to touch on is, is this regions and availability zones. So this is um, a representation of what a region looks like. Um, so it's a typical region. And what you'll notice is in this region we have four what we call availability zones and two transit centers. Um, so transit centers are where we do our connectivity. This is how we connect to the internet. This is how we connect to what, what we call our direct connect locations. And this is also how we peer with our other regions and with global internet providers. Each availability zone um, has a different risk profile. So within a region, we'll have at least two availability zones, some as many as five. Uh, the UK region currently has two availability zones. Each of those availability zones, like I said, has a different risk profile. But they are close enough apart, so uh, less than two milliseconds, typically less than one millisecond apart, that means you can deploy services across both availability zones, but in a synchronous way. This is great for when you're architecting services for high availability because you can have them being delivered from two availability zones at the same time, synchronously replicated. Uh, it looks and appears as though it's in one data center. Actually, behind the scenes, it's in different physical locations. Within a single data center itself, we have um, typically between 50 and 80,000 physical servers, just to give you some idea of the scale. That typically assume, uh, consumes somewhere between 25 and 30 megawatts of power. Um, Worth mentioning that no data center exists in more than one availability zone. So that means a failure of a data center will impact the availability, perhaps, of a single uh, availability zone, but not the others. So this is how we architect for scalability and, and availability. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. Um, we've looked at bigger data centers. So people sometimes ask, why aren't your data centers quarter of a million in size? You know, we know you do. Amazon does things at scale. Well, you know, we've got a long. Uh, uh, track record of experience in this and what we found actually is that bigger data centers have bigger blast radius So if you have a, a data center outage when you've got a quarter of a million servers that becomes much more difficult to handle than it does when you have um, a smaller number So that's the optimal one that we found And that leads on to how do you architect on the cloud for best practice? What are the best practices when you want to deploy services into uh, AWS? And over time, we've come up with uh, what we consider sort of seven key principles for deploying services into the cloud. Firstly, and this is probably the key one, design for failure. Um, second, build security into every layer of your application. Three, make use of all the different storage options we have. Uh, and we'll talk about all of these in a bit. Four, um, elasticity. This is one of the key benefits of the cloud, the ability to scale up and down on demand to react to uh, changes in demand. Think parallel. This one takes a little bit of uh, guessing around. I'll explain a little bit more about how this works later on. Loose coupling, again, more of a sort of technical concept, but something that once you understand is a way of helping you deliver and scale um, through individual teams developing their own services and then linking them together. And lastly, don't fear constraints. So in the old world, when you're developing services on premises, you might have a certain amount of budget, so you can only deploy a certain amount of kit. Therefore, you have to run services sequentially. In the cloud, you can take that same budget and deploy 100 services in parallel for a shorter period of time. And we'll talk a bit about how that works. So number one, design for failure. Um, so this is a very simple representation. Let's assume we've got a single virtual machine uh, with a user that's talking sorry, go back um, to a single website. In this, everything's on a single server. If that server goes down, we lose the website. Okay? Very difficult to scale, very difficult to make a highly available um, infrastructure. So let's design for failure. Let's say, let's put a load balancer in front of it. Let's distribute the web traffic across multiple front end web servers so that um, if one of those web servers goes down, the load balancer directs to the remaining uh, instances in there. Similarly with the database, we now have a database, a managed database service called Relational Database Service that can do active, passive, and do automatic failover. So here again, we've spread 
the, um, the service across multiple availability zones. You notice here we have two availability zones. Uh, that means that the impact of a single service or a single um, set of availability or a single availability zone won't impact the overall service. So design for failure and nothing should fail. Number two, build security into every layer. This is probably um, one of the key points about AWS. At AWS, we always say security is job zero. Um, it's the most important thing. Building trust in our platform, giving people the ability to deploy secure workloads is critical. So we have a lot of tools. Um, Wayne showed the picture of the service map. Uh, a lot of those are around either security or management of that security capability. Um, you have control uh, to implement the important layers. Uh, you can control encryption for the data in transit and at rest. We have a range of tools for that. We have something called a key management service to allow you to manage your own encryption keys and to rotate those as needed. Uh, we have a very granular, what we call IAM service, Identity and Access Management Service, that allows you to give specific users permissions for particular parts of AWS. And that can be as granular as only being able to access a certain server on a particular day at a particular time from a certain IP address if you've authenticated using two-factor authentication. That level of granularity. We allow the ability to create security groups, which you can think of as firewalls that are applied to every instance. So you can control exactly which services can talk to which service, and also to do that at the subnet level. Um, and also we have um, very sort of deep and uh, integrated multi-factor authentication. One thing um, that we, you'll hear us often talk about is something called the shared responsibility model. So for the shared responsibility model, we say that we're responsible for security of the cloud, whereas the customer is responsible for security in the cloud. So we look after things like the security of the data centers, the underlying networking, the hypervisor, the physical kit. But as a customer, you are responsible for how you do things like patch the operating system, how you configure your security groups and firewall controls, how you run, manage, patch your applications. That's your responsibility. Now, you may choose to do that in conjunction with a partner, or you may have your own in-house teams to do it. You may choose to want, use one of our uh, more managed services, such as a relational database service, which, in fact, takes some of that responsibility for you. But it's useful to remember that you are always responsible for uh, the ownership and security of your data. That's key. Number three, um, leverage many storage options. So with an AWS, we have um, a range of services. So this, again, we've talked about before. This is a sort of um, a scalable service. CloudFront is our content distribution network. This gives you the ability to effectively offload a lot of the um, caching of static data or infrequently used data into our edge locations. So uh, as you scale, those requests are served by CloudFront. They don't actually impact your core infrastructure. All, everything's delivered uh, remotely. You can then actually use um, what we call our object storage, which is called S3. Uh, this allows you to put uh, a huge number of objects in a very durable, scalable fashion at a very low cost. Uh, within web instances, you may have different types of storage attached. So if you've got a requirement for um, archive storage or very sort of sequential throughput, we have magnetic storage options. If you've got a database that requires tens of thousands of IOPS, we have something called elastic block storage, which will allow you to handle that type of workload. So there's lots of different abilities to, uh, to choose the storage option you want. We have in-memory services such as Redish and Memcached, and obviously our databases as well provide that persistent data layer. Um, what we try and say, and I'll talk about it a little bit when we talk about elasticity, um, is really you want to try and make uh, your application store state, so in other words, store customer data in as few places as possible, because then everything else can be scaled out and down on demand without having to worry about data replication. Um, just to give some example, uh, so that was a standard website. We also have a service called DynamoDB. That's our NoSQL service. So RDS is our relational database service, covers things like MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, um, uh, MS SQL, and our own one called Aurora, as well as uh, MariaDB. DynamoDB is our, um, as I mentioned, our NoSQL. It does both document and key value pairs. Uh, we have Elasticache. That's our in-memory service, uh, Redis, Memcached. Number four, um, this is often the benefit that is talked about most within AWS, and it's one because it's, it's very easy to translate into genuinely, uh, genuine savings uh, very easily. So traditionally, uh, when you're uh, designing your infrastructure on-premises, you have to make trade-offs, and you typically have a set budget to do your, your work with, and you have to make one of two decisions. 
Am I going to provision for my peak capacity, in which case I've got a lot of capacity sat around doing nothing? Or am I going to provision for my average capacity, and then for times when that goes over the limits, I have to struggle with either the site responding poorly or not responding at all? Within AWS, you don't have to make that trade-off. We have services such as auto-scaling that allows you to react dynamically to the changes in load. So as services, uh, as your load goes up, we automatically add capacity into that infrastructure. As the load goes down, we automatically reduce it again. This is a free service. Um, it's part of the management set of tools within our EC2, uh, uh, so our compute service. And it helps you to basically um, really deliver the amount of scale you need as you need it. What is important to remember is obviously as you scale these up and down on demand, these, this is being done automatically. So it's very important to remember when you design an auto-scaling service, you want to try and be as hands-off as possible. Every time a new server comes in, you don't want to have to log into the box and configure it. That won't work. So it's all about thinking about how you automate your service. Um, that's where um, partners, where the solution architects team can all come and help uh, in terms of thinking about how your application works. Think parallel. Um, so as I mentioned before, AWS is a, a pay-as-you-go model. This means that um, we charge typically per hour. Uh, so if you take a, a particular instance, that might cost you 10 cents per hour. If you run that box for 10 hours, it will cost you $1. Or you could run 10 boxes for one hour and still pay that dollar. So it allows you to think in parallel. So this means that when you're deploying an instance, um, this, the entire left-hand side might be a set of services you can then deploy the same thing on the other side as well. So you can begin to scale by, by effectively uh, replicating services and pushing them out. It's also great for things like test and dev as well. Uh, how many organizations want to have um, or require a development or a system test environment that's a replica of live? If you do that in a traditional on-premises environment, most of the time it's sat around doing nothing. You need it for maybe 10, 20% of the time. Within AWS, you automate the deployment of your live environment. You take an exact copy of that and deploy it in development. You run it for a few hours, you do your test and dev, and then you turn it off. And once it's turned off, you don't pay anything for it. So you know, properly managed, you can reduce your uh, dev cost by you know, anywhere up to 80% if you only use your development environment for 20% of the time. Sort of related to this, um, loose coupling. Um, so Wayne talked about the um, innovation approach we have at AWS and how quickly and rapidly we innovate. The way we do that is something called two pizza teams. Um, it's a very sort of American phrase. What it basically means is almost all of the service teams and product teams in AWS are the size that can be fed by two pizzas. What this means is that's a small, very close-knit team that can innovate rapidly, and they have the authority and autonomy to deploy their new versions uh, when those are ready. To do that, we have to ensure that any services they use aren't tightly coupled to other services. They can't have big dependencies on other services. So loose coupling is a way that we say of allowing you to pass messages or pass services between teams without being dependent on the inner workings of those services. This means that we can really ra uh, rapidly innovate and deliver services without having to do everything in a sort of, you know, this month, this is our six monthly release patch and then we're gonna do a new version in six months. We iterate on a daily basis. From a customer perspective, that means you can use some of our tooling like our simple queue service uh, to ensure that you have different processes. So here we've got, um, in the top level, we've got effectively one process that uses um, three services tightly coupled. So it may be on a single box doing all of that. On the bottom layer, we're connecting them using queues. So you might have one set of services doing the upload, one set doing the transcoding, one set doing the not notification. By loosely coupling, it means these can be scaled individually and so in response to where actually the bottlenecks are. So loose coupling is a really great way of thinking about things. To help you with that, we have a range of the higher level services. So Wayne talked about um, compute and storage. What we also have though is a range of services where we're delivering, where we're working sort of higher up the stack. So we have things like video transcoding. You upload a video, you choose the type of encodings you want, and we spit out at the other end your MP4s or your AVIs, whatever it might be. If you want to do search like Elasticsearch, we have a managed Elasticsearch service. Uh, things like databases, I've talked about RDS, I've talked about um, no, uh, my, uh, DynamoDB, which is our NoSQL. Redshift is our data warehousing service. Monitoring, we have all sorts of monitoring and alerting, not just for your system, but also for the underlying APIs and so on. So, um, and we'll touch a bit more on about that this afternoon when we talk about handling workloads for the public sector and some of the security considerations around that. 
And lastly, I think this one um, is probably the most important. It's the one that's maybe hardest to get your head around if you're used to, used to a traditional on-premises environment. Don't fear constraints. Um, if you've got a box, uh, the example I tend to use is um, if you uh, know you're developing a new service and you think it's a database service that might require 5,000 IOPS to work, run properly. Traditionally, what you might have done is you might have gone out to a few hardware vendors, asked them to spec up a tray of disks that would deliver that. You then probably have to get three quotes for that. You then have to procure it. You have to wait for it to come in, install it, configure it, test it. Maybe if you're lucky in three or four weeks' time, you're in a, a position to test that environment. What you'll probably find out then is either it only needed 1,000 IOPS, or worse, it needed 10,000 IOPS, you have to go through the process again. With AWS, what you have the ability to do is go into the console, click, I want a volume, 10,000 IOPS. Five seconds later, you have it. You run your application for an hour. You test it. You look at the metrics that generated in CloudWatch. You find out that actually only needed 2,000. Fine, you delete the 10,000 IOPS volume, create a 2,000 volume IOPS. It allows you to rapidly innovate in ways that you probably wouldn't consider otherwise. So things like IOPS for databases. So I've talked about one possible way of doing it by upping the storage. You can also do things like scale horizontally. Um, you can also put caching in front of it. There are lots of different ways you can address common concerns that you may not have had in an on-premises environment. Um, hardware failed. So again, going back to the uh, design for failure, traditionally on-premises, what you might be doing is having you know, a lot of focus on keeping individual servers up and running. In the cloud, we try and make sure that the service is designed so if one box fails, we just replace it with another one automatically. A common analogy that people um, use with cloud is uh, something called pets versus cattle. Not sure if anyone's heard of this. Traditionally on premises, and you may have seen this in your own data centers, when a server comes up, you give it a name. Um, one of the first servers, uh, or the company I first worked for, gave it based on body parts. So hand, heart, eye. Um, got a bit dodgy towards the end, clavicle and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you then tend to look after it. So you ask how that server's doing, you try and patch it. Cattle, on the other hand, is more about effectively your infrastructure is just in a herd. If one of those uh, causes a problem, you just replace it with another one. Um, also gives you the ability to do things like DR. Um, so I've already talked about availability zones and how we can take a standard service, and instead of having a sort of active passive where your passive is in a data center 150 miles away, and therefore you can't do it synchronously, so it's always a sort of in standby. With AWS, you can actually have your services running active active across availability zones and design for that failure. So you can um, recover from loss of even things like an entire availability zone. So that's a sort of a very brief sort of introduction, I think, possibly five minutes earlier than planned, so we might even get a bit more time back up. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm around for the day. There's other people from AWS. I'm not sure if you want to put your hands up, anyone who's here from AWS, so we can, um, yeah, so typically lurking at the back is normally where you find us. Um, but in the meantime, I think that's it from me.